Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you're all having a good Tuesday afternoon. I'm just going to wait for numbers for all these participants to join. The numbers are really going up. This is so exciting. Uh, I want to firstly thank Fashion for Good for asking me to host this wonderful session. Numbers are going up. We've already passed 100. And I can see people from all over the world joining. This is what I'm loving about, um, about these webinars is that it's really making people, I can see India, I can see London, I can see uh, Amsterdam, gosh, Hong Kong, people from all over joining. This is so exciting. As I said, I'm just gonna wait a minute or two and then I'm going to start to have a good number of participants. Thank you so much, everybody, for signing up to this. Fashion for Good have been doing some really interesting seminars, and I've been watching a couple of them. And I was really excited when they asked me to host one, uh, especially this one, because it looks at textiles in India, which is a subject really close to my heart. Hello, we have someone saying hello from Paris. Hello back to you, bonjour. Okay, so I'll start in like a minute. Bristol, Sweden, wow. This is a global audience for sure, Indonesia. This is really great to have such a great participation right now, especially as I know things are opening up in most places right now and it's a really really busy time for everyone so thank you so much for taking this time out um, and joining us we have a really wonderful set of panelists so it's going to be an interesting talk but shortly before we uh, start um, fashion for good always like to do a poll they like to know a little bit of who's with us it helps us know in which direction to take this talk and how, what to do in the future. So in a second, they're gonna put up a poll on your screen and we'd like to share with you, are you a student? Do you work for a brand, manufacturer, consultant, just a consumer, or like me, a member of the press? If you could just hit the right section. So this poll is something we'd like to do before we start for anyone who's just joined. We'd just like to know a little bit about your background. It really helps us put together the questions and future seminars. Just let us know, student, designer, innovator, manufacturer, brand, and working in the chain, anything. Just let us know what you do. If you could let us know on the poll, that would be great. and the numbers are going up, we can see them. Lots of designers, lots of manufacturers. Press, I can see working elsewhere. This is a lots of students. What a wonderful, varied, uh, very um, audience we have today. Well, we also have a wonderful panel with us. And we are here to discuss the impact and innovation in textile manufacturing. This industry is probably one of the industries that has been hardest hit by this pandemic. And um, just like every industry is having to rewrite its rules, so is the textile industry. And it's really being challenged. But in many ways, this pandemic has acted as a catalyst towards good fashion. And that's something we really do want to focus on, the impact and um, innovation. I'm Sujata Somal. I was born and brought up in London. I moved to India in my 20s because I had such a love of Indian costume history and textiles. I worked as a journalist for many years, launch editor of Harper's Bazaar India. And last year, I wrote my first book, which looks at um, film costume history. And I call myself a mindful fashion advocate. And I'm really excited because on this panel are two female, really foremost change makers. They're really dynamic. 
first, can I introduce Dipali Goenka, CEO and Joint Managing Director of Wealth Fund. She's spoken about innovation, the future of the Indian textile issue, uh, innovations in Indian textiles on many platforms. Uh, for many Indian women, she's really a role model. So thank you so much for joining us and taking time out, Dipali. Thank you. And from Amsterdam, we have Catherine <laughs> Lee, Managing Director of Fashion for Good, a platform. Sorry, sorry that's me. Ah. So the Managing Director of Fashion for Good, the glo it's a global platform for sustainable fashion innovation. And she firmly believes um, that companies, if they focus on innovation and sustainability, they can come out of this crisis in a really positive, positive way. And we have one gentleman, and he's usually very low key, uh, but a very, very effective driving force in sustainability in India. He's Arvind Limited's Puneet Lalbar. He has a master's degree in environmental science from Yale, a trustee on the board of uh, Wildlife Board of India. He truly lives the green life. Thank you for being here, and thank you all in the audience too, but I know the audience must have so many questions for you. Um, if I can just ask the audience to wait till the end to ask the questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first question. We are all, as I said at the beginning of this, embracing the new normal. And uh, this reset really has made us relook at everything in all our lives. Um, but I'd like to ask you, and I'll start with Dipali, um, what do you hope you can change for the better in your own life and at the workplace? So I think um, with pandemic that has, uh, you know, challenged the world, um, I think there has been a very rare and unique opportunity, Sujata, to reimagine and reset the world in totality. Um, as, as we talk about, you know, when the leaders used to walk the talk, they will have to walk the belief. Um, as the economies are coming back to normalcy, sort of staggering back, I think, how about adapting green recovery that Germany is also talking about that builds back better? I think it's a very interesting thing to talk about. Um, we all know that the carbon emissions have gone down in April to down by 17% since 2019 and end of the year by 8% a staggering low since World War II. So Sajada, when you talk about me and the pandemic and what, what is the thing that you could do better and what you have been doing, I think for us, at, um, as Churchill, Winston Churchill said that, you know, never let the crisis go waste. I think such an interesting opportunity to, you know, recreate, reset ourselves. So at our factories, you know, uh, where we are talking about, uh, you know, the, um, the COVID protocols, mm -hmm. I think that will become the new norm that we're talking about. The virtual, now, I mean, could we ever th think about having a webinar the way we are having? I think that that is going to be very interesting. I mean, our virtual walkthroughs with our customers through the factories, our inspections, our showroom walkthroughs, the product uh, uh, discussions are having virtually. So, you know, the new normal is going to be very, very different. And I feel that, you know, um, um, with work from home, I think, you know, it's going to lower the carbon, uh, carbon emissions even more. And I think that's going to be a very important way to adapt as you go forward, Sujata. So I think for me, importantly, I think work from, uh, work from home will become the new normal at Wells Fund. It's going to be the way forward because I think the way we have worked effectively, collaboratively, will establish that norm. At the factories, um, it has never been so effective that the people our, our workmen, our associates, have followed the social distancing norm the way they have. I think that's going to be very, very interestingly. And I think, I think all of us, I think, is, is the time to see as the planet Earth heals back, and it has healed back. I think how are we going to retain it and sustain it will be very, very important. So I think I will stop there. And uh, I think sustainability yeah, will be something on my mind as well. I think work from home is a thing every business owner I'm speaking to is saying the whole benefits of it. And I can see that becoming something very big. Um, Puneet, anything you'd like to add to that, please? So I think, um, you know, the biggest impediment to change is your own success. And 
when you have a moment in history that sort of challenges you as much as this crisis is, has challenged everyone, I think, you know, people are more open um, to embrace change. And it becomes a lot easier to sort of question something that, you know, you thought was sacrosanct before. So with, you know, the example that Dipali mentioned about working from home, um, be it, uh, you know, working with a staggered workforce, questioning, you know, your, your manning norms, questioning your ability to do presentations from halfway around the world, all these, you know, things have been questioned and, uh, you know, the teams have come up with, come out with flying colors. So I think the, the, the key, key sort of learning from this uh, and the silver lining of this is that we learn to sort of question things that we thought were impossible and, and make them possible. I sincerely believe that many such things throughout the supply chain and in the industry will be questioned going forward. And it's a real opportunity for us to, to sort of get over that activation energy, um, uh, to get enough activation energy to sort of move forward uh, on, with sustainability as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to see uh, and hoping that the world embraces this opportunity and this point in time as you know, really a seminal moment for pushing sustainability forward in the supply chain. Catherine, I know you were speaking to people all over the world and, and, and to industry people. I'd love to know how you feel the industry has responded, particularly in the manufacturing sector. Um, thank you, Sujata. Well, when you, when you started this webinar, you said that the, the industry has, has been hit hard. Um, obviously, the global economy has been hit in total, but fashion has been hit incredibly hard. And um, I think there are some projections for the full year 2020 that, that sales will decline between 30 to 40 percent. So it's it's a real slump that the um, that the um, that the industry is, is is hitting, and that has severe financial consequences, um, cash flow, liquidity. That's that's the immediate reactions that we saw from from all of our our partners. This really first phase of um, how do you react to to ensure your your survival. So I think that's also an important dimension. Um, to consider and with that came you know retail closures with that came serious amounts of overstock and probably an economy that that will remain challenging um, for quite a while um, as we're seeing even with stores being reopened consumer behavior still being um, um, being cautious um, and um, We've also seen, obviously, from the from the social side of things, um, workers in the supply chain, but also on the retail side, being being tremendously hit, be it on you know with with furloughs, be it um, with um, with reduction overall. So I think what we've seen with this pandemic is really this um, intertwining um, um, setting where environmental dimensions and social dimensions um, come together, and you know. My and our first um, thought was, you know, with this pandemic had hitting at a time where we just saw this this momentum, you know, where sustainability commitments of various players, both manufacturers and brands, really going strong, um, with consumer behavior moving in a in a direction where values and you know socially responsible behavior was was really more acknowledged. We clearly saw the risk that there might be, be now a delay, that there might be now a resetting of, you know, um, strategies and um, all these, this momentum that we created that this might be, be put at, at a pause. But I have to say with all the discussions that we were having with our partners, yes, there is a short term reaction in terms of really fighting for survival and, you know, decluttering P&Ls and making sure cash and liquidity is being protected. But we also see this really strong commitment towards 
rebuilding in a way that builds it back better. Um, Dipali mentioned that. So this, this commitment towards innovation, this commitment towards sustainability and really using this um, reset moment as, a, as an opportunity to now double down to together brands and manufacturers with consumers and maybe policy makers really join forces, invest together to, to build back better. So I, I fully agree with what Punit was saying and, and Dipali was saying this, this um, challenging situation can indeed be a, a catalyst for change if we now use that moment together. It's like you said, sustainability was a word that's been, I think the buzzword for a while now. And then I, I, to me, it feels like this pandemic has brought the talk of sustainability right to the forefront. But even before this, we were hearing about PACs and conference and agendas addressing the issues. But I don't think many people, I mean, it just seemed like it was being addressed. But it seems like this, to me, this pandemic has made people think they really have to put this into action. Um, what's your feelings on this, Puneet? And, and what does sustainability mean to you? So sustainability, we have a very simple definition of sustainability. For us, sustainability means doing everything that allows us to perpetuate into the future indefinitely. And for us, that means looking at what is most material to our business. Um, and what we've, what we've done is we've done that assessment and we've come up with six things. Uh, money, number one. Money is needed to, to keep the wheels turning. People. Um, without people, you know, innovation is impossible. Um, and then the, the key inputs, water. Uh, raw material, so in our case, fiber, um, chemicals, energy, and then there's a seventh, waste. So those seven parameters, uh, how do we achieve excellence on all seven? Uh, to give you an example, for we've, we've worked really hard on our water and we've um, sort of eliminated almost to the extent of 100% uh, fresh water from our supply chain. We either recycle the entire amount or we have uh, partnerships with brands, partnerships with municipalities. For example, we launched uh, a joint project with GAP to make our last facility that was still using fresh water um, tie up with the Ahmedabad municipality to, to get uh, wastewater. Similarly, on agriculture, we're working with about 70,000 farmers to grow cotton more sustainably. So in each of you know, these seven areas uh, of, of materiality, how do we, how do we achieve excellence? Um, and excellence in a way that allows us to perpetuate um, indefinitely into the future. So that's, that's a very simple definition of sustainability. Um, and the encouraging bit is that um, as we've gone on this journey, more and more partnerships have become possible. More and more innovators have sort of uh, stepped in. Um, in. The kind of startup landscape that's now developing, a lot of thought is going into it. So this achieving of excellence and pushing the boundaries is going to become easier and sort of more prevalent across uh, more supply chain partners. So that's, that's you know, our, our thought on, on sustainability and where, you know, the, the industry is headed. I think the GAP project's been a real, real good benchmark uh, for, for everyone. And I know people have, have read about it, how it partnered to someone and you've done innovation. It, it's kind of the way forward. But uh, Catherine, maybe you can explain to us how fashion for, uh, fashion for Good fits in all this and how you help brands innovate and collaborate and what your exact role is. Yeah. Well, I think the, the pacts that you mentioned and the, and the commitments, that's the start of the journey. And um, I'm, I'm glad that there are more and more brands and, and manufacturers really, really joining those pacts and really thinking about what, what the targets are that they would love to achieve, to have a better understanding of their footprint and to know where the journey should lead towards. Once you know that goal, um, you realize um, that it's quite a journey to get there. Um, Puni has just elaborated on the various areas of action that you would need to address. And I think the reason why Fashion for Good was set up was clearly because there is a gap between where we are now and where we want to go um, that we cannot bridge that gap 
without innovation, without looking at disruptive innovation, without looking at solutions that don't exist at scale today. And that's um, why Fashion for Good was set up, um, to identify those innovations. Um, startups really from around the world, looking at solutions that tackle all these different dimensions in the supply chain, looking at raw material innovation, looking at processing, line finishing innovation that use less chemicals, less water, um, all the way through closing the loop on innovative recycling solutions that use waste as an input. And that also includes transparency solutions, traceability solutions. So it's really across the board. And these areas are defined based on also the needs that we hear from our partners. Um, if a brand would like to have a 100% traceable supply chain and we need to look at a solution for a certain fiber, we go search. If there is the need to look at something, a new material that is fully compostable and has a, an amazing um, environmental footprint, we go search. So we scout those, those innovators um, and select them together with our partners and then help, help them scale. So we're really working on the next frontier to bring those solutions that um, will hopefully allow to create this state of, of good fashion um, in a, in a you know, collaborative way. So collaboration, um, brands, manufacturers, innovators, and not to forget you know, investors, um, very important um, financing that, that enables this roadmap to scale. Um, that's, what, that's what we do. And it just seems like innovation really is, is, is the key thing right now uh, that everyone is talking about when it comes to, to changing, especially with COVID. And when I think of Wellspun, I think um, innovation is so key and embedded in your organization. So I'd like to ask the, the, the party a question um, on this. What do you see um, on the role of innovation? And what is, the, what is the impact right now on all your sustainability initiatives uh, that this tool has, has, has brought upon us? I think this comes in, um, so I think uh, when you talk about sustainability and innovation, they both will work hand in hand, uh, Sujata. And, um, and I think it comes in with more resolve now, all the more. I think uh, um, Kathleen said that, you know, the lot of projects uh, would, you know, will go slow. But I think this becomes a great opportunity for us as an organization to take that forward. So innovation is something that starts from the consumer, Sujata. It starts from the consumer and what the consumer is looking at. So, um, and when you talk about the product, whether it's sustainable or non-sustainable is the criterion that we talk about. I'll, I'll give you a small example of how do we take on innovation at Wells Fund. Uh, we have uh, in America, a small set of home, um, home uh, enthusiasts. It's called the Brain Trust. We have around 2,600 people there. So any product that we make or any kind of a feedback that we get is where we, that becomes a starter for creating any innovation that we do. Um, sustainability is something that will be deeply embedded in a whole supply chain for Wellspun. So whether we innovate, whether we have the supply chain, because we are moving from linear to uh, the circular economy. And um, I mean, Innovation is one aspect to it. It'll be embedded in the whole supply chain. Our, um, our story starts from the scrapyard. So when people talk about cradle to gate, it's going to be cradle to cradle. When you're talking about the life cycle, it's going to be cradle to cradle. How does that happen? Can the scrapyard become the wealth for you is going to be a very interesting aspect. Can you see when the plastics can be translated and, you know, rather than using the virgin plastic, can we recycle it and get it back into the whole supply chain? Looking at wood, could, looking at metal scrap, and of course, your waste that is generated out of cotton. I think the landfills is a very big question that we have. And circularity will be a very important aspect. So innovation and sustainability going hand in hand and looking at how we can really create products that can be sustainable, that can actually uh, be an answer to the circular economy. Otherwise, there's, there's no way that we'll be able to help. And I think when I talk about textiles, I sometimes feel guilty. The maximum consumption of water, the landfills that we're talking about, cotton that we basically uh, use. I think there, there's a lot that we have to find solutions ourselves. 
So I think when Puneet talked about cotton, I think we are working on these better cotton initiatives with farm workers and farmers across in India, where actually the better cotton, uh, you know, consumes lesser water, practically one third of the water than the regular cotton as well. So I think there are a lot of interesting things, Sujata, that come your way. And I think the supply chain um, will be a very important aspect from, from, the, uh, from the farm to the shelf and back to the factories again, I think will be a very interesting way of looking at circularity and innovation. I think that, um, I think this, uh, as you said, this whole supply chain and, and how we can transform it is something that uh, is, is something that's very key right now. And I think one key innovation that has come out of this pandemic is how quickly companies like both your companies have taken to making PPE equipment during this time. So I think it's estimated now that India makes 4.5 um, lakhs worth of equipment daily. Maybe it will be one of the countries that is the second highest supplier to the world of PPE equipment. This has been really quick and, and the way you moved was so agile and so quick. I just wonder, will this also help us manage this whole supply and demand? And as you said, this, this waste, will this ensure that there is not waste between supply and demand right now? Um, Puneet, in particular, um, Arvind Mills has taken this a step further um, with the kind of antimicrobial and antiviral solutions. Um, I think you've partnered with a Swiss company, HiQ. Can you tell us a little bit more about this and how this innovation um, will Sort of change things in the future at your company? Sure, as, um, as Dipali mentioned, you know, this type of innovation comes from listening to the customer. Um, and, you know, the state of the world right now being so dominated by uh, Corona thinking, um, you know, that, is, that was the obvious motivation for, for, for getting in into uh, you know, this line of, uh, of, of work, be it PPEs or be it uh, antiviral fabrics. And I think a lot of, and I think the innovation has all, always existed in the world. I think it's about, a lot about make, taking innovation to, to the consumer is about connecting dots. Um, so our philosophy at Arvind is about working with people who have already done the hard yards and partnering. Uh, partnership uh, sort of features very prominently in everything we do. Um, and that's why we took the step uh, to partner uh, with this company and, and bring this, uh, this product to the market. Um, I think, you know, the, the innovation and sustainability makes a lot of business sense. Um, you know, when there is demand, you know, sustainability makes a lot of sense. When there, is, there are cost pressures, sustainability makes a lot of sense. If I consume less, if I consume more efficiently, it's going to make a difference to my bottom line. The role of innovation comes in to the subset of circumstances where, you know, things are mispriced and that direct relationship between sustainability and profitability uh, is not there. And therefore, you need a new innovative approach uh, to bridge that gap. And that's where, you know, partnerships, especially with innovators uh, who are living, breathing the problem day in, day out, makes a lot of, lot of difference. And, and the role of people like us who have access to the market, who have the infrastructure in place, uh, who understand the market very well, is to sort of help some of these innovators uh, reach the customer. So I think this is the example that you mentioned uh, is an example of this happening. I, th I think the buzzword right now is, if I'm not pretty, is profit with a purpose. Is that correct, Puneet? Sure, I think, uh, I think that's always been true. Uh, I think- But it seems uh, like everyone's talking about that a lot more right now. I think people's eyes have been opened to that being even more relevant in today's context. and. The hope is that you know it, it's it's made an impact to the extent that you know this will this the sort of it will be a permanent change that will will sustain even in the future. I know the Indian newspapers have been writing a lot about Welcome and the kind of diverse range of PP equipment you guys have come out with in such a short time. And 
what I've been reading about is a lot about the upskilling and, and the digital changes you made so quickly. I, I'd love to know more about these and how you think you will use this in, in the post-pandemic era and what you learned about upskilling and, uh, and digital Diwali. You know, it is, um, Sujata, I think um, uh, this pandi pandemic has been a really a great learning for all of us. And I, I would say that the things that we couldn't do earlier, um, they have just accelerated. Our uh, learning, um, the whole digital initiative, uh, whether at the, it, it's at the front end in the terms of e-commerce, uh, globally uh, in our whole, uh, whether it's United States, UK or India, um, it has completely accelerated. Um, and when you talk about the front end, even like looking at virtual showrooms, now, I mean, would you need that showroom space? Would you, can you reduce that showroom space? It's a very interesting thing. I mean, and that's what we are working on now creating a virtual showroom and uh, taking uh, the customer through that virtual showroom. And that's what we've done so far. Um, talking about the products and imagine creating the texture of a product, though definitely the feel of the hand is definitely important. But I think the conversation, the, the look and the feel uh, can definitely be through this virtual me medium. Um, when I talk about the factories, uh, factories where um, you know, we would have the visits, but now we can do the virtual walkthroughs of our factories. Um, virtual walkthroughs. Um, we, in fact, I mean, interestingly, uh, did our um, uh, uh, COVID uh, protocol audit by one of the big fours. It was a grueling seven hours, but uh, we did it virtually, uh, creating virtual inspection rooms. So I think there are a lot of things that will really come your way. Um, and that's what we have been doing. Um, and with this, I think what has also accelerated is AI. AI in the terms of quality. I mean, we had been earlier partnering with um, uh, one for quality. Um, so in our rugs plant, we have an AI uh, for quality where I think that can actually help us to accelerate because the human eye tends to get tired. Um, and one of them, uh, one of them which we are talking about has been a part of Fashion for Good uh, Innovators, where uh, we are looking at a cobot and a seabot for uh, cut and super rugs. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, importantly, uh, Catherine spoke about traceability. Um, we have a patent called Welltrack, which traces the cotton uh, to the end, uh, to the last product. Um, but now we have we are. Uh, we just did, did one, the first uh, POC with uh, one of uh, the uh, innovators at Fashion for Good called Infree Chain uh, for blockchain. And that's going to be something that we want to really take forward as we go forward. So I think, um, Sujata, um, I think uh, digitization is going to become the new normal. I think when we spoke about uh, e-commerce and the world was scared about it, where United States was at 20% uh, digitization, India was at around 17, 18 by end of this year, it could go up to 30% or more. So I think uh, it's going to be a new way of uh, looking at things, new way of uh, uh, buying as well. And I think Puneet, when he spoke about uh, the PPE, I think that's, that's going to become a new normal. The mask will become a new fashion quotient. Uh, there'll be a lot of innovations there as well. Um, so interestingly, I think uh, digitization is here to, uh, to stay, whether it's at the e-commerce level to uh, the way we sell our products, the way we'll be working at our factories, um, and the whole supply chain. I think where we talked about data analytics, data, data will become so, that data will become the new normal. Earlier, we have been talking about it for the past two to three years. But I think we are going to be adapting it and we are adapting it sooner or later. I mean, sooner, I think, uh, you know, we can talk about. So I think, uh, Sujata, I think uh, digitization has been something that Wellspun's really embraced and we are learning. We literally are learning. I think that's where we are today. I think this period has been a huge period of learning and relearning for all of us. And that's one of the positives that have come out. But Dipani, you spoke very strongly about all the work you've been doing with Fashion for Good and the innovators if they've helped you uh, Fine, Catherine, I'd love to know who are some of the key innovators you've been working with and what is your take on the kind of innovations you've seen come out of the pandemic? You know, we spoke earlier about innovation and sustainability going hand in hand. I think the pandemic has also brought digitization in that group. Digitization and sustainability are also now going, going hand in hand. I think 
the areas of innovation that um, were, you know, that gained more awareness and attention because of COVID-19 and the ripple effect of the lockdown, they're, they're threefold. At least that's what we heard, you know, from the discussions with our partners and where we put a special program against. The first one clearly is digital um, acceleration. And there's so many opportunities across the whole supply chain. If you think of B2B, um, related digital acceleration opportunities from digital design, digital merchandising, um, all the way through B2C solutions that now allow um, customers or consumers to, you know, have a better digital fit, a virtual showroom, a live selling session. There's so many just amazing um, innovation areas um, emerging. But next to that, there's also, um, there was also, a, you know, Specific, specific focus against supply chain transformation, um, making sure there's a safe workplace set up, there's social distancing rules, there is, you know, startups like Inspectorio, um, their supply yeah. chain um, auditing firm, they've pivoted. Yeah, well, exactly, and have offered a um, for free um, COVID um, protocol or COVID um, assessment solution. Um, so, Stock, stock management maybe is a third one um, next to digital acceleration and supply chain transformation. That is an area that is not new, but has received um, increased attention given the, the overstock um, issues that we're facing. So startups that are addressing um, rework, um, that are addressing you know, rental or resale um, opportunities like renewal workshop have also gained um, specific attention. So I think what we've seen with COVID is areas that aren't new, but that have all of a sudden um, gained um, additional attention areas. In a sort of good practice. news though, I would like to add that one. The good news though is that um, the areas of innovation that are so fundamental for a real transformation of, of the supply chain, like raw material, like end of use solutions, they are still top of the agenda. They might not, you know, have the immediate implementation opportunities tomorrow and are, you know, helpful in the short term crisis mode, but the commitment from all the partners, both brands and manufacturers, against those longer term innovation areas is still there. And that's incredibly encouraging to hear and to see. <clears throat> um, any shift in piloting activities, Puneet? Um, no, of course. Um, you know, if you look at the immediate few months uh, after the crisis, I think uh, everybody will be focused in trying to get their bread and butter business back on track. But I think, you know, there will be, you know, an eagerness um, to, to pilot and to collaborate with solution providers that provide some of the answers to a changing world. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the financial trouble and the, the sort of, um, sort of, ability to invest that has been perhaps impacted by the crisis in the short term will be more than offset by the need for new solutions. So I don't see the supply chain piloting less. I think, uh, I think the right solutions will, will get the uh, attention they deserve. Mm. Great. Well, I'm going to, I know I can see the question just mounting up, so I'm going to be asking my last question or set of questions before I move it up to everyone in the floor. Um, it's really clear to me out of everything that you said that it's really been about out of the box thinking right now. And this is the need of the hour. Um, and my last question is going to center around that. Um, what is the support right now that manufacturers really need to man transform themselves? Because you can have all the, the thoughts, but it takes much more than that to actually make, to action these things. So how do you become a force for good, create an employment, yet be profitable? The party, maybe you'd like to start. I could start, but I think Puneet could also be, uh, you know, could add on to that. I think, uh, I think manufacturers can't work in isolation, and uh, nor can the supply chain as well. So the MSMEs, I think, are the bedrock for, uh, you know, for the whole supply chain for uh, textiles. And uh, government uh, initially supported them in the very beginning as well, so that they could start off and. Uh, pump up the economy as you move forward. But I think uh, 
so I think the, it's the whole supply chain. It is the whole, uh, um, I think the government, without government uh, uh, partnerships, without um, partnerships with, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, organizations, um, um, institutions, um, I think, and brands and customers, I think we all have to collaborate together to get things happen. Because if I can tell you that manufacturing after uh, agriculture employs the maximum people okay. and, and we have to see how it survives, how we can really uh, talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, you know to, if, if we have to talk about India transform, I think that's where, uh, you know, we all need to work on. And I think that's where we can't do without collaborations with the government supporting them, uh, different bodies um, uh, supporting them. And uh, I think, Puneet, that you can add on a few things as well that could help. Sure. Um, I think um, just to, to uh, take the, the point further um, that you were making, I'd like to talk about two initiatives. Um, I think the, it's very important that the cost to make a fundamental shift in, uh, in the way the industry thinks and does things, uh, it, that needs to go down for it for wide adoption to happen. And the only way it goes down, it can go down, is to is to share the costs. And and um, there are there are now some good examples. I think fashion for good is 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 such an example where where it's creating a platform uh, for for individuals to come and then members to pool resources together to to bring those innovations to light. Um, another example that I've been involved with is the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, where a good, you know, 50% plus a turnover of the entire global industry has come together to, to define, um, you know, the common language of sustainability and create a race to the top uh, by, by me through measurement and, 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 and reporting. And now, you know, there are platforms, uh, I, 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 I sit on the board of the Apparel Impact Institute, where we're trying to go from collective measurement to collective impact, where we want to get the brands, manufacturers, and other stakeholders um, to actually collaborate, where one third of the funding comes from the manufacturers, one third comes from the brands, and one third comes from um, uh, charitable sources, to be able to bring to light uh, fundamental shifts in manufacturing practices, in knowledge around uh, around green energy, in, in clean chemistry. So, how do we how do we sort of tap into the collective power of the industry to make change less painful for the individual? As an individual, it's almost impossible to to completely change. But as 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 a combined group and and as an industry. If the costs are, are, are shared, um, you know, in a logical manner across the industry, um, innovation can scale a lot faster. Mm -hmm. I think what's come out very, very much is that Fashion for Good has worked so very well and closely with both Urban and Wealth One. And um, maybe you can tell us how exactly you supported them, um, Catherine, and and how does the Good Fashion Fair help manufacturers in the region, specifically in India? Yeah. Well, I think Arvind and, and Wellspun are real, real pioneers being keen on testing and collaborating with, with innovators. Um, then building on what Punit said, there are different types of innovations and there, um, this type of innovation makes it e either very easy or very difficult to scale, depending on what the cost mechanic is. So there are those innovations that immediately lead to, to efficiencies. You use less water, less chemicals, less inputs, makes the business case immediately clear for, for manufacturers. Um, there are innovations that are immediately picked up by, by consumers, also creates um, a very clear business case. But then there are innovations that have a longer lead time that require quite some capex investments on behalf of the manufacturers um, that do not have an immediate business case. So make it way more challenging to push forward. And I think that's the, the hardest nut to crack. And that's what we're trying to do here also at Fashion for Good is not only try, do we try to serve um, interesting innovative solutions to partners such as, as Wellspun and Arvin, but we're also trying to, to create these, these magic triangles um, that involve a brand, 
um, that is interested um, in a solution signaling demand, the manufacturer who is keen to, to implement that innovation and the innovator. And having that um, articulated in whatever offtake agreement letter of, of commitment that eventually also then allows to mobilize financing. I think this orchestration is really the hardest nut that we have to, to crack in a global complex um, supply chain but that's that's um, the approach that will unlock um, unlock really innovations at scale and the good fashion fund is um, one vehicle that um, that we've set up to address this this difficult nuts the, the, the financing needs so the good fashion fund is um, a lending vehicle um, that helps um, or provides um, a lending facility debt financing to two manufacturers who are um, willing um, to invest in an innovative solution. It targets mostly SME manufacturers, but could also um, you know, be in scope for larger manufacturers if the solution truly is disruptive. Um, we've launched this, or we started this fund quite a while ago, but eventually the first close happened um, last year with Laudis Foundation, with the Mills from Hong Kong, and just um, a couple of weeks ago also Rabobank joining. The ambition is to have 60 million US dollars available to finance just those projects. And the geographic areas are India, Bangladesh, and uh, Vietnam as a starting point. So that's another vehicle that um, we've we've set up to you know bring more financing in that space and remove all the hurdles that exist to scale to scale innovations yeah and i think if people want to know more they should go on to fashion for goods web, website and instagram because it really is is something that i think everyone in the industry should really know about the wonderful work and, and the wonderful work the fund can do oh, thank you Sujata. <laughs> we have some we, we have so many questions I'm a little overwhelmed, but that's, I'm going to start with one for Dipali. Um, can disruptive innovations help Indian textile industry to achieve profitable growth? Yeah, it can, Sujata. And I think... Um, this is a uh, question that came, uh, came uh, from one of the registrars. So. <clears throat> so disruptive innovation can... Can you just repeat it again, Sujata? Uh, Sorry. Can disruptive innovations help Indian textile industry to achieve profitable growth? Um, you know what? Uh, disruptive innovation, um, it has to, we have to continue to innovate as textile industries. We can't, otherwise we'll get redundant. So um, uh, what is disruption in this? Disruption would be minim minimize the water, minimize the water that we use, recycle the, uh, recycle our, uh, the circularity, what are the things that we can create out of that, so I think it's, it's the whole um, supply chain that we need to really look at here. And um, disruptive innovation is something uh, we can continue to seek for. That, that is, there's never going to be a right or wrong. I think it has to be a constant innovation that will automatically create, and it will become incremental. But incremental innovation is critical uh, for us to survive and to sustain. Um, disruptive innovations um, would be something that, you know, we have to continue to look at and identify. Um, I think uh, that's where I would, uh, I would uh, just add on. Uh, like, you know, disruption could be in the terms of materials. Disruption, it could be in the terms of uh, uh, the supply chain. Um, I think these are the things that we have to really look at and see what could that be. The important thing is if we can get the robots and cobots to create and create the productivity on the floor. Um, and I think upskilling our workers, and I think if we can create something, the way that if we can increase our productivity, that could become a very interesting way of looking at uh, uh, what we can really uh, contribute to the textiles as well, apart from the products and the supply chain. Great, I hope that answered a question. Um, I'm seeing there are lots of questions from young entrepreneurs and smaller companies um, who want specific advice. And their advice is mostly um, about startups. Oh, these are all startups. Um, most questions we're getting are from startups who have a goal of producing garments sustainably but cannot meet the high MOQs of sustainable manufacturers. And they want to know what advice you have to these smaller companies. Right. Yes. So um, I think um, I think the first step to um, being able to you know 
build a business is to is to think about you know who who your product will will address so what what unmet need um, of the industry um, the product will will address for example companies that are large that have access to consumers um, are looking to be different um, today the entire industry is moving towards value and if everybody was to just continue the same way then margins are just going to continue to shrink that's where the value of ideas um, is it, 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 there is there is a strong value to ideas and so if you can be that idea provider and sort of plug in um, to to you know the larger platform um, then that's one way to get your product uh, to market I think the role of technology is the other way. Uh, I, I see a lot of innovation and, and, and this is rapidly improving and becoming more and more user friendly on, on, on e-commerce uh, platforms where small individual entrepreneurs through sheer excellence of product um, are able to reach the consumer at very low cost. Um, so I think you know, these are the kind of opportunities, either partnership with, with people who already have access and who already have incurred the large costs of a supply chain or tapping into technology driven options. I think these would be the two areas that I would, uh, I would encourage you to explore. Wait, I'm gonna move on to another question quickly. Um, India's indigenous processes and models of textile production have been you know, environmentally friendly inherently. I think that's something India has always been well known for globally. Uh, so what are the models that perhaps the rest of the world can learn from, from India, do you think? And why are, not, why are these models not more omnipresent in the industry? Well, may, maybe I'm as a non-Indian here. Uh, the non-Indian is going to take this one. <laughs> but I, I think there is something um, in the context of circular economy and um, increasing the lifetime of a garment. Um, India has an amazing traditional and, and pool of, of capable um, crafts, um, men and crafts. Right. Women. A lot of our crafts are, I mean, a lot of like the, one of many of our stitches are actually about patchworking all pieces together. A lot of our beautiful crafts are based on that, you're right. Exactly, so I think that's a huge opportunity if you think of the you know, opportunity for renewal um, activities, for e-commerce activities. These are exactly the skills that you need, um, which many other um, parts in the world don't have those skills anymore. So I think there's an, an amazing opportunity to think of circular models in a way that really taps into the expertise and the knowledge in the country. Um, so Catherine, I'll just add on to what you said. Um, this is also a great uh, sustainable uh, aspect where people like us, you know, and that's what we are doing in a brand spun. We upcycle around two tons of rags that are generated out of our factory and the communities around us, you know, because when you talk about Kutch, it has a lot of craft as a talent. So, you know, in these kind of centers, uh, you know, where, you know, these women meet and they, they make rugs and uh, cushions out of it and which are sold globally. So, you know, it is kind of, uh, it creates jobs. It uh, also upcycles the rags that are generated as well. So it's a very interesting model that, uh, that actually India has taken on as well. I have another example. Um, so we are um, working on a regenerative organic cotton project where we're trying to actually use, um, use uh, farming techniques to sequester carbon into the soil on top of you know, the farming being organic. And then we're taking this organic cotton and going to weaving communities and spinning khadi, khadi uh, mandlis. Um, organizations that, uh, that, that make khadi yarn, getting it spun by them, uh, working with weaving communities to hand weave it and hand, hand dye it with natural indigo. Uh, and then stitching it all by hand. So no electricity, 100% um, uh, you know, uh, handmade product um, and we are able to provide employment to a few mandlis and we are able to provide um, sort of a market for a product that is highly premiumized that shouts made in India um, and um, creates value and employment for for various communities yes it's small um, 
But if there are enough people doing these small things, and the example that Kali mentioned is would fall into that category as well. And then there are people doing it at even slightly larger scales, like Fab India, incorporating a lot of uh, traditional uh, indigenous communities into their product uh, category. So there, there are a lot of these examples of people sort of working with these communities. I think more of that is needed. I think more of that is possible. And I think more of that will happen. And it needs uh, good entrepreneurs who have, you know, uh, the passion and time uh, to be able to, 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 you know, create that link between um, beautiful craft and, uh, you know, a consumer perhaps uh, uh, halfway around the world. So I think um, it's, a, it's a valid question and I think it's, it's, an, it's an avenue for a lot of people to take advantage of. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of talk about uh, about such beautiful projects, and I'm seeing that media is sort of highlighting all these projects, and more and more entrepreneurs, like you said, doing this. But I think, like all of you said, it ultimately has to come that the consumer wants this. And we've had someone ask about um, how does the panel think a consumer can promote responsible uh, behavior and responsible consumption like this. And will responsible and more mindful shopping, in fact, impact your profitability? Most oh, certainly. Um, I think um, a lot of innovation falls by the wayside um, because there is nobody to buy it or we didn't communicate it well enough or, um, you know, it fell through the cracks between the understanding of the manufacturer and the brand. So a lot of these things, um, you know, don't see the light of day. Good ideas don't see the light of day. Um, because, you know, the story wasn't strong enough uh, or there was nobody to, to pay the, the, the price for a product or there was nobody who thought that product was cool enough to buy. So if people start making responsible buying choices, um, that's, the, that's the engine that pulls the train. Um, so, so I think that will, and, and I'm, I'm starting to see it happen. Um, I'm starting to see consumers, uh, you know, in the, in the age of, uh, of uh, digital information available so easily. Gen Z and, and the millennials. Yeah. Right? The millennials and the Gen Z, I guess. Yeah. 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 Very difficult to fool them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Greenwashing. It's a good thing. So it's, it's a good thing. So proper sustainability will see the light of day because of a very ed educated consumer. I agree with that. Wonderful. There are so many more questions and I'm so sorry we can't get around to them, but maybe you can put them in the chat and we can see if we can reply to some of them because we do have this wonderful panel. Thank you, Puni. Thank you, Dipali, Catherine. You were wonderful. Um, there is going to be uh, another wonderful uh, webinar that Fashion for Good are doing. It's called Meet the Innovators of South Asia Edition again. It will be another wonderful expert panel. That is on the 9th of July. And it would be great if um, you could sign up for that one. I know I'm going to be signing up. Do keep checking out Fashion for Goods at Register. Um, but before that, I'd like to ask each speaker to just give one closing statement so that we can leave this with some sort of summary uh, of what we've discussed this hour. Um, shall we start with men this time and go with Puneet? Um, I would like to just say three words that will spur um, you know, the future of sustainability. It's collaboration, collaboration, and collaboration. Wonderful. Dipali? Uh, for me, sustainability is now about circularity. Um, and I think uh, we, let's move from linear to circularity. Uh, and I think that's going to be the new norm. And we have to do it now. And it's very important for all of us um, as textile manufacturers, and uh, I think we have to contribute here as fast as we can. And Catherine, would you like to have the last word? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the opportunity to really use this this crisis to double down on the commitments towards innovation and, and sustainability. Use this this moment as a catalyst for change. Yeah, I really believe this moment can. There's a lot of good. I know there's a lot of doom and gloom that people are focusing, but there's actually a lot of good. And this is a catalyst and this is a changing moment. And this moment will define 
things in the forward. So this is a time for good. Thank you again all so much for logging on from all over the world. I hope you all stay well and stay safe. Thank you to Fashion for Good for asking me to host this. It's been incredible. I have learned a lot, real insight, so I'm sure you did. And um, hopefully we'll see you on the 9th at Fashion for Good next event. Thank you all again so much. Stay safe. Bye, everybody.